Hello and welcome to In Conversation with Kashmir Times. I'm Anuradha Bhaseen. Battle lines are drawn as Pakistan goes to polls on February 8. In the run-up to the elections, there had some interesting twists and turns. What is likely to unfold and what does this mean for Pakistan, for democracy and for peace in the region? To discuss all of this and much more, we have with us today Mr. Ejaz Haider. He's a prominent and senior journalist based in Lahore. Welcome, Ejaz. Thank you, Anuradha, for having me. That's a heavy menu, by the way. <laughs> Peace and going forward, democracy and the rest of it. Yeah, yeah that, but That's sure. the interest for us. So. so tell me, you know, there are reports of in the Last few weeks, there was this talk of whether the elections will happen or not happen, and uh, that there was low-key electioneering. And suddenly there are reports that, you know, there is some enthusiasm picking up uh, ahead of the elections. Is that really happening on the ground? And why is the scene now changing? Right. So uh, let me begin with an interesting uh, anecdote. We have a WhatsApp group and, uh, you know, they, they've been for the last three, four months, uh, people have been wagering on whether the elections will happen or whether they'll not happen, you know, that kind of a thing. And then, of course, the ECP came online and said elections are happening. Uh, February 8th uh, is the date. Uh, you know, other uh, ad administrative things have been happening. Uh, holidays have been announced. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And yet, one of our friends uh, in the group, just 48 hours uh, ago, said, uh, is the wager still on? And we said, well, you know, you've already lost the wager because the elections are happening. And he said, no, I'm doubling down on my wager. We're like, really? So everyone was saying, do you have some information that you're still doubling down that there will be no election. So my point being that the entire thing has been so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, in, uh, unstable, if you will, uh, with so many, as you rightly said in your opening, with so many twists and turns and meanderings, uh, that uh, no one was really sure that elections will happen. Uh, but I'm assuming that they will now. <laughs> on on Thursday, uh, on coming Thursday, that is. Um, but yes, uh, there uh, the enthusiasm. Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure if I would still use this word, but there has been uh, more movement uh, compared to the previous uh, ten or fifteen or twenty days. Partly because, because of this rumor mongering also and because of this uh, uncertainty uh, that I just mentioned, but also because it's very clear to everyone that the most popular party, at least in terms of uh, polls, uh, opinion polls in the last year, year and a half, has essentially been knocked out of the race. You know, technically speaking, there is no Pakistan that he can uh, because uh, the election commission of Pakistan said that you did you did not hold internal elections. Then it went to a high court. Then it went to the Supreme Court, and then Supreme Court also uh, endorsed the ECP's version of things. Uh, again, I'm I'm not a lawyer, but obviously one reads legal opinions, and since one knows because of one's profession, uh, eminent lawyers in Pakistan, uh, the general sort of consensus is that uh, these decisions are selective, uh, in which you apply law in a certain way, although you peg it on a certain point of law. But the fact is that courts seem to ignore the context in which certain things are happening. And so there are two uh, sort of opinions on that. There are the textualists who say, no, you have to go by the text of the, of the law 
And then there are contextualists who say, well, you know, you cannot really be deontological about this and you, you need to uh, apply the law given the context to see what, you know, the establishment, which is sort of, you know, the code word for the military uh, is, is trying to do to knock out the Pakistan Tariq and Saab. So that is one of the primary reasons for the lack of uh, election activity that is normally associated with polls in Pakistan, also in India. Because, you know, I mean, uh, of course, India is 1.4 billion. Uh, Pakistan is not uh, that huge in population, but uh, Pakistan is also a very populous country, you know, in terms of like we are now 245 million or so. So there's a lot of, uh, as we put it in in, in uh, Urdu, Hindi, Halagula, uh, in terms of election campaigning and all that, that is clearly missing this time. Yeah, we'll we'll come to more on uh, about what is happening to uh, Pakistan, Tehreek and Saf and Imran Khan later. But you know, many re media reports uh, earlier suggested that you know Nawaz Sharif's victory is a foregone conclusion. And uh, in the last few days, do you think that is changing? Um, Bloomberg, in its report, pointed out, uh, you know, that the uh, the PTI has. Uh, pockets of influence within Pakistan. There are other key players who are have influences in various places. So who are these different uh, political parties who could be the potential winners? Who are the main contenders in the race? Okay, so uh, a couple of things. One is that Pakistan Tariq and Saaf, by all indicators, uh, is a currently the most popular party. And I think the establishment knows this, the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz knows this, the Pakistan People's Party knows this, uh, and other political contenders also. But in the last uh, year or so, uh, or especially I would say post 9th May, when a crowd attacked Lahore Cantonment and the Corps Commander's House and a couple of other uh, you know, military affiliated, uh, non uh, professional inst uh, installations. Uh, and then the military's response to that. Uh, we have seen a very clear uh, effort at, if I were to use a military term, effort at a shaping up operation to make the environment conducive for knocking out PTI and for knocking out Imran Khan. So the cases against him, the verdicts against him, the effort to make him run from pillar to post, uh, picking up uh, some of his uh, ardent supporters, uh, forcing people, you know, ex-PTI ministers and, and members of parliament to leave the party uh, and a number of other measures that have been taken to ensure that PTI is thoroughly bludgeoned and, and, and in order for it to not be able to draw on its popularity. Now, just as an example, the successful attempt to deprive it of its election symbol, which is the cricket bat, essentially is to confuse the voter in the sense that the candidates who are going to contest as PTI candidates will now be assigned different symbols. And it will be extremely difficult for the voters to understand or to, to clearly identify who exactly is the PTI uh, candidate in a particular constituency. On top of that, by knocking out PTI as a party itself, now these candidates technically are contesting as independents. Everyone with their own symbol. So all of this is essentially a shaping up operation. So, so this links... So this links up with with 
with what you, uh, you know, where you began with your question reference, Mia Nawaz Sharif's victory as, as a foregone conclusion, all of this effort has gone into making that possible. And but... yet, <clears throat> uh, by most account, by most accounts, it is still not clear. Obviously, it is going to erode into eat into the PTI vote uh, because the system itself has been rigged uh, against the party. But they're still not sure. Uh, you know, some of these estimates are saying that after PMLN, PTI will still be the second largest vote getter somewhere in the vicinity of 60 to 65 National Assembly seats, which is 10 or 15 seats more than Pakistan People's Party. You know, you've talked about how um, the establishment has ensured that there's no level playing field, which means that there would be no, uh, the election you fear will not be free and fair. And this hasn't happened for the first time in Pakistan. A lot of people are drawing parallels between 2018, when the establishment backed at that time Imran Khan and the crackdown was on, on Nawaz Sharif. So how do you see this whole situation of the uh, establishment being all supreme? And what does this do to democracy in Pakistan? Right. So now we, with this question, we have got to uh, the point where we realize that the problem is bigger and broader than its present iteration. So the present iteration is Imran Khan versus the establishment, but there have been previous iterations of this problem. And the problem essentially is about the Pakistan army as an institution uh, trying to dominate the system now, it has dominated the system three times. If I count out the internal sort of who where General Yaya asked President Yu to sort of step down uh, three times or three and a half times, if you will, uh, direct interventions. Now, direct interventions, one can understand because the military is up there uh, overtly. But... 2008 onwards, there has been there has been a lot of talk to, between 2018 and the vote of no confidence against Imran Khan. A lot of talk about a hybrid system. The fact is that post 2008, it has been a hybrid system. And the hybrid system, if you ask me, uh, as a realist, not as as an idealist, not in terms of an abstract ideal of civilian supremacy. The hybrid system can work if there is a certain balance. Now, Imran Khan had an ideal uh, sort of opportunity to make it work. But unfortunately, at some point, that apple cart was upset and in a way uh, where you then have a lead up to what happened to the you know at board of no confidence and thereafter obviously this has an impact on democracy but let me also add one thing which is uh, as a as a former i say former because it's been a long time i've kind of moved away from my study of uh, CMR, civil military relations, but it's kind of peculiar to Pakistan. I mean, if you look at coups in Africa or Latin America or even in Turkey or Indonesia, you don't have militaries come in and then seek legitimacy. In Pakistan, every time a, you know, a, a dictator comes in, he tries to seek some kind of legitimacy. And he does it by two things. One, he reaches out to the judiciary and gets the judiciary to somehow legitimize the coup. Mm -hmm. And secondly, after a brief interlude, initial interlude, tries to reach out to the political actors. 
and to try and create a new king's party because and and th and there's a reason for it because the army while trying to safeguard its institutional interests is also keenly aware of the image it projects and not entirely wrongly by the way that of a national army which has the best interests of pakistan uh and therefore it's not like the the myanmar army uh it's not like uh, you know it's not like uh, penoche or it's not like galtieri or it's not uh, like the latin american or african armies where uh, they'll just you know shoot and kill people and the rest of it uh so they they try to while guarding their their institutional interests they also try to project themselves as the guardians of pakistan's security and interests so they they required some kind of legitimacy which is why they tried this with nawaz sharif to have some kind of hybrid arrangement with him it did not work out they tried this with imran khan it did not really work out and this is where the problem arises because if you have a parliamentary system if you have the chief executive which is a civilian uh, principle constitutionally he is going to uh, essentially uh, tell the army at some point that here look i'm the boss so that's where this tenuous balance which is already tenuous uh, becomes uh, even more problematic now if you ask me how this can be corrected uh, yeah i was coming to that, that my own sense is and i have actually written about this using uh, mao zedong's principle contradiction framework that you have to decide the civilians have to decide uh where does the principle contradiction lie is it between the civilians and and the army or is it between one set of civilians against another set of civilians right so imran khan was uh pushing every other political opposition leader into a corner when he was in power mm -hmm. and when he was out of power the next dispensation has done everything that the army directly or indirectly has wanted it to do in order to put imran khan into a corner so at some point the civilians have to understand the real nature of the principal contradiction and to that extent they will then have to establish some rules of the game among themselves regardless of their other differences because obviously they they'll be contesting against each other which is perfectly legitimate but that contest has to be according to certain rules we have an example of that i mean we we used to have this kind of uh, unscrupulous contestation between the ppp and the pmln during the 90s but once nawaz sharif was ousted by musharraf ppp was also out of favor they came up with the charter of democracy and now khan's party will also have to at some point when this present storm is over or is weathered will have to become part of some kind of charter of democracy before they can begin to contest against the army's uh, dominance so would you say that you know if the political parties have uh, to free themselves from the military stranglehold they would need to first of all democratize themselves and maybe come together on some common minimum principles of democracy and uh, is that what you're trying to say absolutely yeah because you see the thing is that so if you look at it in terms of the occupation and the occupied the occupier uh, is enjoying an advantage he is not going to uh, you know one day decide that because of some moral uh, epiphany 
he is going to remove the occupation. No. The occupied will have to formulate strategies in order to contest against the interests of the occupier. And that requires some agreement on minimum principles, but minimum but fundamental principles, and the rules of the game. That yes, we will be contesting against each other, but we are going to do it not in a in a you know some kind of freestyle manner, but there will be certain rules. But more than that, there is also the issue of governance. The civilians will have to provide governance. They will have to do something about the economy. They essentially they will have to deliver. And delivery is very important because uh, let me give you an example. Although the, the, the multiple you know multiple variables and you you cannot apply the particularities of one uh, one sort of set of uh, circumstances onto another. But look at Turkey efforts. If we go back to the time of Nahmutin Erbakan uh, party, he came to power. Uh, he was considered an Islamist by the Kemalist secular Turkish military. And he, he immediately tried to push his agenda. And uh, the Turkey military uh, ousted him. But when Erdogan came, he decided that he is going to play by the rules of Kemalism in the initial years in order to consolidate, improve the economy, uh, link up with the European Union. And, you know, because the Europe, linking up with the European Union and becoming part of the EU is also part of the, the Turkey military's agenda. But then very smartly, because if you are applying for the EU membership, you have to check certain boxes, independence of the judiciary, uh, you know, civilian supremacy, uh, rights, uh, blah, blah, blah. Which he didn't so do. He actually, so he actually used the military's agenda to undermine the military's predominance within the system. I mean, I am simplifying a very, very complex situation, but I'm just trying to make a point with reference to the kind of strategies the civilians have to adopt. Now, the, the problem is that Pakistan requires a strong military. There is no doubt about that. Uh, we live in a, in a rather rowdy neighborhood and therefore we need to have a very strong military. So we, when when I say that the civilians have to, to 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 prevail upon the military, it is not by weakening the military, but by strengthening the civilian side of the equation. But by clearly demarcating and the roles between the military precisely, and the political precisely, establishment. You know, right? Lots of lots of critics of Pakistan's military end up suggesting measures that will end up weakening the military. Now, that is a big no as far as I'm concerned, because I think the military, we need a very, very strong military, and we need to constantly improve the strength of our, of our military. But specifically on the issue of military's intervention into politics, the civilians have to adopt strategies that strengthen their approach to governance, uh, you know, help them understand the deliverables without weakening the military. And one of the problems with Imran Khan's after he was ousted in a vote of no confidence was that he started going out and speaking to his supporters, almost implicitly inciting them to go against the army, the not in the sense, not in the sense of, of you know, strengthening the civilian side, but in terms of weakening the army. 
And he was also counting on a lot of support within the former, the, you know, the veterans, the retired officers, uh, and also presumably uh, on the on the support of uh, serving uh, officers. And it went to the absurd extent where it was very clear that he's asking officers within the army, serving officers, to actually mutiny against the brass. Now, that's a very, very dangerous proposition. And I have, you know, I wrote like four or five articles saying, do not take this route because it will, it doesn't serve your interest. It does not serve the interests of the Pakistan army. It does not serve the interests of Pakistan. And 9th May was that proverbial straw on the camel's back, which broke it. And, and the military had so essentially sort of remained uh, on the defensive up until that point. Then it went on an offensive. And from there onwards, it has now gone into an excessive mode in terms of ensuring that PTI and Imran Khan are completely finished off, which is again a mistake. So yeah, Khan, he... be began, Khan began with a bad strategy and the army is now pursuing. Right. An and and, and bad you know, coming to the present, you know, last week he's been convicted 10 years and 14 years in two different cases. Uh, do you think there would be a backfire oh, yeah. effect? Today, today, just, just just before we spoke, he has been convicted for another seven years mm -hmm. for quote unquote illegal marriage. Okay, and yeah. do you think this would have a, a backfire? This could have a backfire effect. Uh, people seeing him as a martyr and uh... see, uh, it is one thing to have a lot of support which he definitely has. It is quite another to actually uh, get the, the rays of the sun to, uh, to, to, to point at, at, at a sharp angle where it can begin to burn the grass. So I, it, it, I do not see how this is, and I'm not going to take a position, predictive position on this, because frankly, I'm not a sophologist. Uh, I don't have any mathematical statistical models to work out the outcomes of the elections. Uh, in any case, uh, there's so many uh, variables here and so many uncertainties here that uh, I don't think anyone should really stick his or her neck out to uh, to try and be predictive about this. Uh, if uh, PTI manages to bring out its voters on the election day, uh, it's a big if. Uh, if they manage to educate them about the various candidates who are the PTI candidates, even though mm -hmm. technically PTI does not exist and there's no uh, one election symbol, i.e. the cricket bat, uh, if there is no further rigging, because the system has already been rigged against the PTI. So it's the system, there has been system rigging and pre-poll rigging already has happened. Whether there's going to be a, any uh, unfortunate attempt at uh, poll day rigging, we do not know. But the <laughs> one of the problems with such an uncertain system is that fortunes can change. I mean, when Nawaz Sharif went into self-exile, no one could have predicted that he would be back or no one could have predicted that his party would once again become the, if not the darling of, of the army, at least the, the more preferred option for the army. And so, so one never knows. How this is going to, I mean, Khan has been given 14 years, 10 years, 7 years. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I don't know whether the, these these uh, sentences, whether they, they work concurrently or whether they do consecutively. Yeah. But what I do know is that at this point, no one can really say where this will, this will go. Right. 
Okay, so I mean, you said that you are not a, and you don't want to be a cephologist, but let's kind of hypothesize and, uh, you know, talk about a speculative post-selection scenario. There are, as you said, different variables and different possibilities. So let's take kind of each of the main contenders. And would you agree? I mean, there is Nawaz Sharif, Imran Khan, there's People's uh, Pakistan People's Party. Uh, are these the three main contenders? Right. So, um, I mean, yeah, there's also the Islamic Pakistan Party. There okay. is another party which, uh, which is a which is a breakaway faction from PTI in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, headed by Pervez Khattak. Then there's the MQM, and I mention these because the establishment is going to count on their small block votes mm -hmm. to to essentially manage parliament after the polls. So what happens if there's no clear majority? What could be the possible post-election uh, alliances? Right. So once again, no predictions, but my sense is that I don't think the establishment wants any one party to have uh, a big chunk of votes, uh, which translates into sizable headcount in parliament. I think what they would want is to have a government with multiple coalition partners. Of course, there will be one party with with a larger number of uh, votes and therefore a bigger headcount in parliament, but not something where a party can you know singly make the government. So if you have uh, a government which has multiple coalition partners, it's easier for you to manage that, uh, to manage essentially the prime minister and his cabinet. Easier because for the establishment. You, <clears throat> yes, easier for the establishment. Because if you believe that the prime minister is not really falling in line, then you can always pull the rug or threaten right. to pull the rug from under his feet. Uh, and and so this is another issue. And, you know, since I talked about CMR and I did say that, you know, I'm a kind of a former student of CMR, the fact is that it was easier, you know, it's easier with over tools to, to essentially analyze. But lots of militaries in varying degrees stay away from coup making but they develop their own ways of capturing strategic nodes within the system and then forcing decisions based on having captured those strategic nodes. You tell me something. And so, <clears throat> If yeah, the sure. army is going to have the upper hand in, uh, you know, even taking political decisions or if de decisions are not being taken in according uh, with the army's imagination of uh, the way things are. So how does it make any a difference, you know, who, who comes to power, whether it's Nawaz Sharif, whether it's Imran Khan, whether it's anybody else, if it's the army pulling the strings, how is anybody else's victory going to impact the politics and economy of Pakistan? So two things. One is that the army uh, is not interested in making uh, every political decision. So armies, so let's list uh, the areas of interest for the army. One is security, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the other over the last, since General Kiani's time, and it's now become a very, very big concern for the army, uh, is the economy. So security, economy, or and and so partly as part of security, also certain aspects of the foreign policy. Uh, and so these are the three main areas uh, which uh, are uh, areas of concern for the army. The other issues of governance, unless they begin to impact directly or indirectly, any of these three areas are not really a concern of the army. So that's uh, one point. The other point is, as I indicated earlier, even when there's there, there have been overt coups, 
the pakistan army has always tried to uh, derive some kind of legitimacy through the courts and also by linking up with political actors so they they don't want to be seen in the driver's seat directly and so therefore they're going to have the the civilians and so there's you know in in the work of a state that there's so many things that the army has absolutely no concern for or about and those issues are to be dealt with by the civilians i have already listed for you the three main areas of concern that the army generally has yeah so therefore I mean, they you, you've talked about uh, their concerns are regarding security and foreign policy so what does this mean for regional stability and peace and i'm i'm particularly talking about relations within south asia uh, relations between india and pakistan um nawaz sharif has kind of mentioned um in his manifesto about um you know he wants to take the message of peace something to that extent uh to india and uh, if he's backed by the army uh do you see prospects for uh, peace and in the region you know? right so uh, uh, you know pre 5th august 2019 uh it would have been easier for me to answer this question uh despite 5th august 2019 uh general bajwa was in fact very keen on having uh normalization with india uh there have been multiple stories and analyses in the indian media also also uh on our side so it's very clear as a matter of fact it was imran khan and his cabinet uh who were not particularly keen on this and they and not because they didn't want to normalize because as you might recall imran khan has been talking about normalization uh through and through but he was also preconditioning it and for us in pakistan 5th august 2019 in terms of article 370 or 35a was a game changer not because we accept article 370 we do not even accept the uh, the the accession of the state to india for us the problem of this action unilateral action was and remains that it india is trying to unilaterally change the nature of the problem uh the nature of the problem which is uh identified in and expressed by the un security council resolution and the un cip resolutions but leaving that aside because that's not what we're debating uh so it was the civilian side which wasn't interested uh in in normalization without india fulfilling as they constantly said without india creating a conducive environment towards that end now uh it will obviously nawaz sharif tried to do that and i think that that was a much better uh time for this kind of normalization as a matter of fact the person who threw a spanner in the works with kargil was the one who was very keen on normalization when he was in the driver seat ie general musharraf the late right. uh general musharraf and he as you know very clearly personally also uh he was the one uh, there was that 2006 conference in islamabad and you know the four point formula and the rest of it and you know all of that has been written about by khushid kasuri also by uh, former prime minister manmohan singh also a number of other analysts also uh your late father uh, was also so keen on on normalization and, and the rest of it so the problem is and i don't know i mean i am now speaking for myself uh and i i think i can speak for myself not just as a journalist but also as a kashmiri uh so that that makes two of us here uh that this particular right wing hindutva government uh has very clearly uh signaled not just to pakistan but also to the kashmiris 
that it does not want any decent solution to this issue the only solution and it's a very israeli solution that they they are essentially foisting on kashmir in your writings on the issue i just like three or four days ago i i did my episode with uh, siddharth vardarajan and i was quoting from one of your <laughs> your articles on what's happening in kashmir uh, in terms of the supreme court decision uh, that you wrote about so so i don't know how they're going to go about this there were back channels so, i mean uh, yeah channel, uh, you know the situation yeah, worked, exists right. as it is can yeah. any um you know prospective government in pakistan do business with india in its present situation you know india as it is with the hindu right wing government a majoritarian government which has its own ideology which has its own political agenda can any government in pakistan do business with that can r- relations be normalized to some extent so let me uh, let me uh, answer this with a question is it possible to deal with a, an ideological government which believes in unilateral actions which by the way and it's not the indian army but which is a a civilian authoritarian uh, setup uh which uh has dealt with the media and public opinion in ways uh in which we ways that we normally associate with military dictators how does what is it what is going to be the quid for the score if pakistan approaches it if if for instance indian say okay uh by the way they have in the last 2 or 3 years constantly stated at the highest levels of the government that we really don't need to engage with pakistan but assuming assuming that they say okay and we say right we want to engage with you and they say okay so here's the here are our conditions forget about kashmir reduce your defense expenditure reduce your uh, stop modernizing your uh, nuclear capability and the rest of it and and we can do business now so then the question for us is are those conditions on which we are prepared to normalize my personal answer is no i don't speak for the government and but i think that the majority of pakistanis would uh, would be very hesitant to accept uh indian conditions for normalization so then the issue is how do you create and if at all you can create some kind of space for a quid pro quo and as things stand especially with india going into election mode now uh in the next 3 months or so i i don't think that uh immediately there is any possibility of that and i'm not sure uh, there will likely to be any possibility especially if the bjp uh, gets a third term after the 2024 elections oh well let's hope this impossibility becomes a possibility no absolutely i mean i i i you see as a matter of fact as someone who has in the last two two years or so done a lot of work on uh, on climate uh, i believe that if for nothing else purely for the sake of survival uh, given the climate challenges india and pakistan as uh, not just india and pakistan but the entire sark region has to come together and of find course. cooperative strategies uh, uh, at every level because you know i mean how do you fight when you are not even there so you know so is are we finally going to get peace in the subcontinent when we we are gone so yes. you know how about how about you know getting there before before we are gone yeah let let's hope inshallah some inshallah. some some better sense prevails Absolutely. on everybody thank you so much 